Come on, who's grateful for the way the looks turned your life around besides me? Hey, it's good to be with you today. You can be seated in the house of God. I want to also take a moment, welcome those of you who are joining us online. Regardless of what platform you're joining us on, regardless of what time during your week you're joining us, so grateful that you've made time to worship with us. And come on, let's grow in our faith together today. When we get together as the people of God, we are doing so much more than having church. We are encountering and meeting with the living God. And his heart today is to speak to you, to encourage you. His heart today is to remind you of just how valuable and precious you were to him. God so loved you that he sent his only son, Jesus, to make a way to restore you back to relationship with him. Come on, he has something in his heart for you today. He has something he wants to speak to you. He has something he wants to do in you. He has something that he wants to lead you through and see you to. I believe it with all my heart. Come on, if you'll believe that for yourself, say amen today in the house of God. If you have your Bible with you today, you can turn to, actually there's three places you could turn, Leviticus 26, Acts chapter one, or Matthew 25. There's a lot of God's word in the message today, as hopefully there always is, but those will be three of the passages that we'll really dive into and dig into today as we open up a new series, a mini-series for the summer called God's Prescription. And the idea is every week it's gonna be God's prescription for, and there's some things that God has put on my heart to begin to help us to unpack. And how many of you know that God's word is the only unshakable firm foundation for our lives. And the heart behind this series is to just identify some of the ways that are common to us, ways we struggle, ways that there's uncertainty, ways that bring areas of life that bring about anxiety or fear or insecurity, and for us to dig into the word in a real intentional and practical way and say, God's word says this about that. And the invitation to us is to begin to embrace in a new way what God's word has to say. For maybe some, for some of us, maybe there are gonna be some course corrections to say, you know what, I had forgotten that God's word or I didn't know what God had to say about that. And I believe with all my heart that as we do it, God's word will go to work in our lives. God's word works. If you're dealing with fear and anxiety, one of the messages we're gonna bring in the next couple of weeks is God's prescription for peace. And I believe that there's a pattern, there's a plan, there's a prescription in God's word that if we will take a hold of it, if we will begin to live it out, if we'll be willing to go and, 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 and walk it out and live it out as God's word prescribes, we will begin to discover a life where we are able to soar above anxiety, fear, and worry. And listen, in, in the midst of real problems, real circumstances, real challenges, real obstacles, I, mean, you know, I, I really believe this with all my heart that the... The presence of peace in our life is not the absence of problems. It's not the absence of something. It's the presence of someone. So just, I'm just giving you a little precursor of kind of the heart behind this series, which, by the way, was inspired when a couple weeks ago we were preparing to go out of town for the weekend, and we were just a couple days away from going to a resort for a couple days where really the big attraction was going to be outside swimming and having fun as a family at the several outdoor pools that were part of this resort. And um, right a couple days before we were about to leave town, one of our kids came down with a really severe ear infection. And so mom scheduled the appointment, took the kid into the doctor, and the doctor said, yeah, it's an ear infection, all right, and we've got four kids, it's not our first rodeo, we kind of had an idea of what it was, and the doctor said, I'll write you a script for this, and, and Amity said, hey, thank you for that, but is it possible that you might be willing to write a prescription for this antibiotic? It seems to have worked better over the years for our kids. And the doctor said, this isn't your first rodeo, is it? And we said, no, it's not. And, and she said, yeah, that one will definitely nip it in the bud. I'll write it for that one. And I thought, you know what? This, this is, it began to speak to me because I realized that how many times do we settle for something that may or may not work in our life when there really is a prescription that's available to us, a pattern, a paradigm, a principle that would definitely work in our life. And I'm telling you, that is the word of God. What God's word has to say about life, what God's word has to say about marriage, what God's word has to say about relationships, what God's word has to say about how to discover purpose and live a life of significance, what God's word says works. But we have to take the medicine. 
Because when I went to pick up the medicine at the drugstore around the corner here, it was one of those antibiotics that came with a litany of all these things that you can or cannot do, how you store it, how you shouldn't store it, when you should take it, when you shouldn't take it, what food you should take it with, what food you shouldn't take or drink whenever you're about to have it. I was about six things in to all the instructions that they were giving me, and I thought, I am in trouble. Mom should be here to hear all this, you know? Like, there's no way I can remember all this and convey it to mom in such a way, and I thought, maybe you should type it out on a note that you staple to the bag, and I could just take it home and let mom read it for herself. And how many know they do that, actually? (laughs) That's what God's word is. We don't have to remember it all. We don't have to do it by feel. It's a written prescription for life. And in this book, in these pages, I'm telling you, is words are words of life that will lead you to life. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22 says this, pay attention to my words. Turn your ear to my sayings, to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Another translation says keep them deeply within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Leviticus 26 says this, and it's an if-then statement. It's saying if you will live this way, then you will experience this life. And it says, if you follow my decrees, you're careful to obey my commands. I will send you rain in its season. The ground will yield its crops. The trees will yield their fruit. Verse 6, I will grant peace in the land. You'll lie down and no one will make you afraid. Verse 9, I will look upon you with favor. I will make you fruitful. I will increase your numbers. I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating. Catch this. This is a promise of God's provision and abundance. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you. I will not abhor you. I will walk among you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Sounds good, right? Amen. I mean, that sounds some, those are some good promises from God. Amen. The precursor is this. If you follow my decrees. If you're careful to obey my commands, if you'll listen to my words, if you'll write them on your heart, if you'll be careful to follow the instructions, the prescription for life that I've given you, your life will go well. If you read further down in Leviticus 26, that same chapter, verse 14, it says, but if you do not listen to me and you carry out and, and, and carry out all these commands, if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands, and it goes on, you can read it for yourself, it's a long chapter, it goes on to just basically outline a life of toil and frustration, a life of disconnection from God, a life of, of troubles and problems, and I'm telling you, it's what we're experiencing in our culture today. Many people riddled with depression, anxiety, worry, fear, despair, because we have turned away from the word of God. And we sing that song, God of Revival, and we sing that song, Come Awaken Us. I'm telling you, one of the things that has to be restored to bring about revival is a restoration of our commitment as the people of God to build our lives on the word of God. It's the only thing that's unshakable. And in a culture that has a a, a wide range of opinions that are even still developing today about how to do life and how to do sexuality and how to do marriage and how to handle money, I'm telling you, there is a word of God that is unshakable that will stand forever, and it is a solid rock, a firm foundation. It's the only thing that deserves your full trust. It's the only thing upon which the weight of your life and your marriage and your family and your future can or should be built upon. Someone ought to say amen. amen. But we've got to return to the word of God. Even in pulpits across this land, there's a, there's a turning away from the infallacy and the inerrancy and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the power of the scriptures. And there's a prescription for life. I'm telling you, it works if you put it to use. Then a couple days ago, actually, as I was preparing these notes already, I, I started having an eye infection that was a sty. It was a block duct here. I'm going to get too much into it. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I, I just looked like a freak, you know. I and mean, people were starting to say, what's wrong with your eye, you know. And I, I realized at some point, I'm like, I'm going to have to probably listen to my wife and go to the doctor. They had normally have to drag me in there, you know. And she set up a teledoc appointment, which was a FaceTime thing. And I put some pants on and accepted the FaceTime call. And, 
and turned the phone around and she said, can you hold the phone a little bit closer to your eye and can you hold your eyelid up and everything? And, and I was sitting there thinking like, how does this work with some other things that you might have going on? You know, like that would be a little bit uncomfortable, maybe a little awkward to do over FaceTime. But I was glad because it was just my eye to use the phone and I turned it around and I held it up close to my eyelid. And she said, oh yeah, see right there, there's a little protrusion and that's a sty and it's just an infected gland and it's no problem. I'll give you some antibiotic drops and it should clear it up in a few days. And I said, okay, that sounds good. Sign me up. And so I went to pick up the antibiotic drops. It was a Friday evening. And I pulled up to the drive through and I told them my name, gave them my birth date and all those things, you know. And they came back after about 10 minutes and they said, Mr. Humphreys, we're sorry, but we are out of that inventory. We do not have this in stock. It's going to be Monday before we can get it to you. And I thought, that's, uh, that's not gonna, that's not a good, that's, this is not good, you know. I mean, I, I need the drops. I need the drops, you know. I mean, I went to the doctor. I went to the thing. I need the drops. Just give me the drops. <laughs> but they don't have the drops, so... I, I, I drove away and I was like, I know I could probably call the doctor maybe on Friday night. Maybe you get the doctor on call. Maybe they could reroute the prescription to a different uh, pharmacy or something. But I said, man, goodness, I'm going to, I mean, I'm really, I look a lot better than I did a few days ago. I'm telling you, I mean, you should be glad that I got the drops. I eventually got the drops. That's the end of the story. <laughs> so I, I, I went home and, and they... Uh, they called me a couple hours later and they said, Mr. Humphreys, we're so sorry for the inconvenience. We actually do have the drops in stock. Someone just stored them in a place where I couldn't find them. And I, I thought, hey, I'm glad I'm going to get the drops, you know. But then I also had the thought, I'm like, are you the ones responsible for storing the managing the opioids and everything else that's there, you know? Like, I'm not so sure about this, you know. Like, someone just misplaced the drops, you know. They found the drops. And so I went back and I got the drops and my eyes getting better. Praise God. Someone say amen. But here's what the Lord spoke to me. Come on, I'm telling you, God's always speaking to me. I'm, I'm always listening. And some of it maybe is the fact that I know that six days later, I'm going to have to stand up here for another 30 or 45 minutes on a day where it goes long and, and, and share something with you. So, I mean, I'm always like, Lord, I don't have enough to share on my own. I got to be listening. What are you doing? What are you speaking? But here's the thing I believe that he'll do in your life. He'll do the same for you. He'll take everyday things that you're going through, things you're walking through, and he'll use it as an illustration to speak to you about deep principles. Isn't the way that Jesus even taught? He said, the kingdom of God is like, and he would tell a story. He would tell a parable. And I, I went through this whole situation where the drops were really there, but they were telling me they didn't have the drops. And I realized that it's how many Christians today are treating the word of God. We've misplaced it. We've put it on a bookshelf. we put it on a back burner. It's in our house, but it's not having its effect. And the Lord just challenged me and said, man, it's time for the people of God to once again go and to pull the, the word of God off of the back bookshelf of their life and pull it into the forefront of their life and to pull it into the priority of their day and their morning where they open up God's word and they say, Lord, I need you to speak something to me. I know that your words are life and I know that to be who you've called me to be and do what you've called me to do, I can't do it in my own strength. I need a promise from God. I need a revelation from God. I need the pattern of God's word. I, I, I know the world that there's all kinds of confusion and there's anxiety and there's fear and there's worry about the future. And, and I know that I could get swept into that really easily by my own devices. And so it's why the word of God has to serve as an anchor to my soul and it has to be the firm foundation of my life and my marriage. I can't be the husband that you've called me to be without the promises of the word. I can't do the thing. I can't raise the kids. I can't lead the church. I can't build the company. I can't do what you've called me to do if I don't have your word alive on the inside of my heart. It's time for the church to dust off the Bible. And I was asking the Lord, I, was, I knew I was going into God's prescription for, and I knew that there were going to be four or five things. I knew quickly God's prescription for peace was one of the things I'm really looking forward to preaching here in a couple weeks. But I said, Lord, what, what are you calling me to preach for the opening message of this series? And the Lord just quickly began to speak to me, and he said, call my people back to a place of devotion. Call my people back to a place of devotion. Call my people back to a place of relationship. Call my people back to their knees in prayer every day, not just Sundays, not just Wednesdays. Call my people back to a place where they are in a quiet place, in a secret place, in their prayer closet, getting away from the distractions of the world, getting in a place where they can just spend time with me. Maybe it's just five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I'm just telling you, dream big and start small. Just make time to just make space in your life and in your spirit to just spend time with your creator, with your maker, your savior, your friend friend. He said, call my people back to a place of devotion. And I want to talk to you today about God's prescription for power. Because we need the power of God operating in our lives. And I'm talking about in daily, real, tangible ways. I'm not talking about in some big showy, evangelical, ministerial kind of a thing or something with, with the haze machine and the lights and the music and the band and the guitars and the skinny jeans which are going out of style, I think I understand, right? I, 
I'm just starting to wear them now. I will not give up my skinny jeans then. <laughs> you can pry them off of my cold, dead body, man. <laughs> we need the power of God in everyday terms, in everyday life. You need the power of God to raise your kids. You need the power of God to be healed in your mind. You need the power of God to be married. You need the power of God to go and do and serve and work. And You need the power of God to deal with that person at work. You, you need the power of God, and it's God's prescription. There's a prescription in God's word for how we walk in power. Listen, we have, we've dumbed it down. We've lowered the standard. It's time for the church in America. It's time for us, Rev City Church. We'll just not worry about whatever. We can't control what everyone else will do, but it's time for us to raise the standard once again for what it looks like to be a Christ follower and a disciple more than a church member. God intends for you to walk in the authority of God. God intends for you to be empowered with power from heaven. God intends for you to be an ambassador of a, of a, of a kingdom that's far away, but you're walking in this earth and you're endued with the authority and the, the legislative support of everything that heaven has to offer. God's called you to walk in power in this life, not just someday when you get to heaven right now in this moment. So let's talk about God's prescription for power. But before we do, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to just speak to our hearts and reveal his word to us. And I'll pray over us corporately, but right where you are, would you pray over your life individually? I don't know what you're going against. I don't know what your unique opportunities are. I don't know what your unique obstacles are. I don't know what the thing is or the, or the struggle is where you need the power of God to come and break through and lead you to or do something in you in a way that you haven't been able to do in your own strength. But, but God does. God knows. And I'm telling you, when we begin to get real, when we begin to say, God, I, 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 is there something that I could, could apprehend? Is there something I could hear? Is there something I could be reminded of? Is there something you could reveal to me today that really could help me to walk in your power in that area where I've been addicted or in that area where I've been struggling or that area where I'm operating and bound in fear or that area where the relationship seems like it's, on the, uh, it's at the end of its rope? What, is there something that, Lord, you could speak to me that could really cause me to step into a new season of relationship with you that brings power to my life? Just present it to God. When you get real with God is not when he finds out about what you're walking through. It's when we begin to be positioned to apprehend the grace of God to begin to be set free from it or begin to live in victory over it. So Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we present our lives, our marriages, our families, our hearts, our minds, our hands, our futures before you, Lord. In the places where there's victory and there's accomplishment and there's forward motion, we're thankful, God. We understand that most of what you do that is, brings blessing in our lives, you do in spite of us. But Lord, we also just recognize every one of us, there's probably some places where they we're going pretty good and there's probably some places where there's a challenge, there's a doubt, there's a fear, there's a struggle, there's a hope, there's a dream or something that maybe has become dormant. Lord, we thank you that in those places, we present those things to you today too, God. And we thank you for the power of God to live a life of victory and abundance. We thank you that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, the word of God says it, it dwells in us, it quickens us, it moves us, it empowers us, and we're sorry, God, for lowering the standard. And would you help us, Lord, to once again begin to embrace and pursue and value and cherish the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the power of God, that we might live a life that brings you glory and makes a difference in the lives of others, and we receive it today. Everything you wanna do, everything you wanna say, to our hearts and in our lives, in Jesus' name. And come on, all God's people said, come on, say amen. amen. God's prescription for power. Acts chapter one, verse eight says this. You will receive power, say power. It's the, it's the Greek word dunamis, which is the word where we get the word dynamite. Come on, that sounds powerful, right? I mean, that's not just like some religious power. I mean, he's talking about some real power, like some real horsepower here. He said, you will receive that kind of power, dunamis power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, a relationship with the Holy Spirit is so empowering and so powerfully important that Jesus actually, a few chapters earlier in your New Testament in Luke chapter 24, he actually said, you should stay in Jerusalem. Don't even go to these places I've called you, these regions I've called you to begin to be my witnesses like he just told them to do. He said, don't even go and try to do it until you've received the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, verse 49. A relationship is so powerful. A relationship with the Holy Spirit is so powerful. Jesus said, don't even go try it. Until you receive, until you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you might accomplish a margin of success, but there's something greater, there's something bigger that I am leading you to and calling you to that you cannot do in your own strength. And I believe it's what many of us are attempting to do. We're trying to lead our lives and build our lives by the power of our own, by the sweat of our brow and by the power of our own strength and ability. 
And I'm telling you, there's an invitation. It's not an obligation. There's an invitation today to see it differently. There's an invitation today to make a course correction. There's an invitation today to say yes to what we're about to unpack for us, a relationship with the Holy Spirit that allows you to begin to apprehend and allows you to begin to experience a real-time, present tense empowerment from the Lord your God through the person of the Holy Spirit that will begin to allow you to experience supernatural results, which is just results that you cannot explain away and you cannot ever accomplish in your own strength and you couldn't take credit for it. He said, don't even start until you receive the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 12, another statement that just kind of could blow our religious mind. This is amazing. Red letter words, Jesus himself. Watch what he says in verse 12. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me, come on, who, who's, who believes in Jesus today? Let me see your hands. Who believes in Jesus today? He's speaking to you. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And catch this, and they will do even greater things than these. Somebody say greater things. He says, you'll do even greater things than what I've done. Is that hard to, to wrap your mind around? This is Jesus who has raised people from the dead and fed the multitudes and calmed the sea. He's done all these things and more. The Bible says if, if, if we wrote about all the things that Jesus had did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain all the things that Jesus did. We just have a snapshot of some things through the New Testament. He said, all those things you'll do, you'll do all of that and even greater things. How? He says, because I'm going to the Father. What, Jesus? I thought it would be because you would be right there with us, kind of helping us and tutoring us and keeping us on track. He said, no, I'm going to the Father. And he said, when I go to the Father, I'll ask the Father, reading on Luke, John 14, he said, and he will give you another advocate to help you, to help you. Come on, somebody, look at your neighbor and say, he's going to help you. He's going to help you. And to be with you forever. Look at your other neighbor who was your second choice and say, he's with you. He's with you. He's with you forever. He's with you. I'll send you another advocate to help you and be with you. Doesn't that sound like something that we ought to want? But anyway, I say this often, it bears repeating, man, this might be the hallmark message where this principle is applicable. And that's this, anywhere where there's power or potential or promise in God's kingdom, you better expect that the enemy is going to show up and try to oppose. And in the case of the Holy Spirit, the enemy has showed up and he's tried to bring controversy and fear around the person of the Holy Spirit. He's tried to point and shine the light on places where people kind of got out of balance and did some things that maybe were actually rooted in their flesh. He's done all kinds of things to cause people to say, I'm not sure I want or need a relationship with the Holy Spirit if it's going to cause me to look or live like that. But Jesus said, I'm sending someone, he's going to come alongside you, and he's going to be with you, and he's going to help you. The Greek word here for that word advocate is, is, is the Greek word parakletos. And if you go look it up, it's, it, it, it says it's a powerful word. It's a powerful word. It, it, it means helper, comforter, advocate. It means someone who comes alongside someone else to help, to aid, or to bring strength. It means one who comes alongside someone else to advocate for and to plead someone's cause, as even in a legal sense. It means one who brings counsel, wise counsel, or strategic legal defense. Listen, in all the things that God has called you to do, how many of you, listen, this is, a, this is not rhetorical, I really want to see a show of hands, in everything that God's called you to do and who he's called you to be and become, how many of you could use a helper? Come on, come on, single moms, you're raising those kids, come on, pe husbands, you're trying to be married to, to that woman who God's called you to live in an understanding way towards, come on, how many of you could use a helper with some of those things? My wife is not here, so I could go with that this morning, she's... <laughs> And everything that God's called you to do and be, how many of you could use a comforter? I mean, come on, sometimes you run into some things that are unforeseen, unexpected. You could use someone to come alongside you in real time, right in the moment, just begin to comfort you. That's who the Holy Spirit is. How many of you could use an advocate, someone to come alongside you and fight for you and intercede for you and advocate for you? How many of you could use, could use that? How many could use a counselor, someone to, when you don't know what to do, you don't know where to turn, should I go left, should I go right, what do I say, what do I do? How many of you could use divine counsel, someone whispering the secrets of heaven into your ear, giving you wisdom for the direction that you should go or what you should do, that's who the Holy Spirit is. He's not a mystical being. He's fully God. And he's a person. And that's the, that's the prescription for power is a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. 
John verse 16, verse 12, Jesus again speaking about the Holy Spirit says this. I said this again. These are three things that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit that really will kind of boggle your religious mind. And, and he, says, he, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in to all truth. He still has some things that he wants to speak to you. He still has some things that he wants to reveal to you. And he says, you can't handle it all right now and it's not all gonna go in this book. There's a person of the Holy Spirit who is going to come and he's going to begin to speak to you. He's gonna remind you. He's gonna reveal Jesus. He's gonna glorify the Father. He's gonna convict you when you kind of start to get off track. And he's gonna speak truth to you. He's gonna help you to know what to do. He's a, he's a paracletos, a helper, a comforter, an advocate, and he's a friend. He's a person. He's not a mystical being. He doesn't just show up when, again, when the, 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 the worship team kills it and they hit the right note, you know, at the end of the song and, then, and there's the perfect light setting in the sanctuary, you know, and there's goosebumps under. That's not the only time that the Holy Spirit shows up. He's a person and he wants to be your friend. Did you catch that, what Jesus said? He said, he didn't say it, he said he. Whenever he has come, he will guide you into all truth. You know why this is important? Because I think many of us have seen the Holy Spirit as kind of like a force or a spirit being or something. And here's why it's important. Because if you don't begin to see him as a person, you won't develop a relationship with him. He's a person. Fully God, real time, present with you as a paracletos, an advocate, a helper, a comforter, a counselor, a friend. Paul in 2 Corinthians, he's writing to the church of Corinth and he says, dear Brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these words, and we're really pushing towards verse 14, but verse 11 through 13 are just powerful, some real good reminders for you this morning. Would you listen and let it hit your heart today? He said, I close my letter with these words, be joyful, grow to maturity. He said, come on, keep growing in God, lean in, keep growing. There's more, there's more, there's... There's a future, there's a calling, there's a ministry, there's more. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful I'm, I'm on my way to heaven, but there's a life on this side of eternity. And he, said, he says, keep growing in maturity. And remember, he's not just writing to preachers or elders or deacons. He says, brothers and sisters, this is his heart for you today. And he says, grow to maturity, be joyful, encourage one another, live in harmony and peace. Then the love of God and the peace of God will be with you. There's a prescription right in there. Greet each other with the love of Christ, Christian love. All of God's people send their greetings, and here's verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Somebody say all. Oh. Look at your neighbor say that includes you. Three things. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He says, if you want to experience the fullness of who God is and what he has for you, you've got to experience all three of these things. And sometimes in some places in church life, we do a good job at leading people to one or the other, but not all three. And I'm telling you, you've got to experience the glorious, magnificent salvation that was offered at the cross of Jesus Christ. You need to experience the love of the Father, but you won't walk in the fullness of victory and joy, and peace, and all these things that were just outlined that are possible for you if you don't experience fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. It's a powerful term. Because how many of you know there's a lot of different levels of relationship, right? I mean, there's people that you just have heard of or maybe bumped into. There's people you knew in high school. There's acquaintances that maybe you've been introduced to or maybe you have a networking relationship with. And then there's people that you're friends with on Facebook, you know. And then there's people that you're maybe a little bit closer to. You look forward to seeing them or bumping into them at church and you'll stand and you'll have a conversation. And then there's close friends and then there's intimate friends. There's just a few people that you really know and they really know you and they're the ones that you call. Come on, whenever you don't, you're not putting the, your day on Instagram, you know, they're the ones you call it. And, and, and there's, there's different levels of friendship and koinonia is the word here and it's an intimate friendship. It's the most intimate of friendship. If, if it was any more intimate, they said that's what you need with the, with the Holy Spirit, fellowship, 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 friendship, intimacy, intimacy with him, relationship with him. He said, that's what I desire that's what you need. That's what you're going to have to have to live this life is that kind of a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit who, again, is not some mystical being. He's not going to make you weird or whatever. He's just God with you, present tense, all the time, good and bad and the ugly and everything in between. He desires to be your comforter, your helper, your advocate, your friend. He longs for a relationship with you. 
In church world, a lot of times we view the Holy Spirit as a means to an end. When we need a healing, when we need a breakthrough, whatever. Listen, I'm telling you, he'll do all those things. When, you, when you're up against, when your back is up against the wall, turn to God. There's, there's, there's not any better place that you could turn. He welcomes that. But I'm telling you, beyond just a means to an end, the Holy Spirit desires to be an intimate friend. Oh, that's good. Someone ought, to, you ought to, someone ought to tweet that out. More than a means to an end, the Holy Spirit is an intimate friend. He wants to help you. He wants to know you. And God's prescription for a powerful life, God's prescription for living victory and abundance, and God is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about how we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit Turn to Matthew chapter 25 if you're not already there. It's a powerful passage. It's a parable that Jesus taught about the 10 bridesmaids, or your translation might say the 10 virgins, and there's a lot that we can glean from this. And Starting in verse one, reading the, the words of Jesus, and he says, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. And the five who were foolish did not take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. And oil, as we're reading this, represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit, represents the presence of God, represents the power of God. And, and oil is oftentimes used symbolically to represent this to us. And you think about all the oil does in our life. There's a fragrance that oil has. And when something gets stuck or jammed or rusted, we use oil. And, 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 and oil, oil oftentimes is used as, as something that is, 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 brings about life and, and helps things to, to just to be prepared. And, and, and so the Holy Spirit is oftentimes revealed as oil in the word of God. And it says that when the bridegroom was delayed, Again, five have had enough oil in their life. Five have not taken enough oil for their lamps. And it says, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And the bridegroom in this picture is Jesus. And, and, and we are represented by the bridesmaids. And it says that they, they became drowsy. They fell asleep. And we sing about awaken your people today. I believe that many people are in that place where we become spiritually drowsy and we've fallen asleep. And the Lord God is coming to you, man of God, to you, woman of God. And he said, come alive again. Come awake again. Stop drifting through life. Begin to apprehend this life of victory and abundance that I have for you. And it says, verse 6, that at midnight they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming, come out and meet him. And all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps, all ten of them. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourself. But while they were out to gone, gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. And later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I do not know you. And he says, so you too, speaking to us, you and I must keep watch. For you do not know the day or the hour of my Return 10 bridesmaids, and I believe they all had the heart motivation to know God, serve God, and make it to heaven and be found with God. But five of them, I believe, were intentional about developing and, and stewarding a relationship with the Lord that brings about spiritual oil into your life, which brings about spiritual strength and helps life continue to move forward. Five of them became preoccupied with what the world had to say about what it means to be successful or significant and the cares of this world. And, and then the bridegroom showed up. The prescription for power is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the way to develop a relationship with anyone is to spend time with them. And just think about it. If the, if the transactional commodity of the economy, of the marketplace, of business is money, the transactional commodity of the power of God is time. Spending time with God spending time with the Lord, realizing that I'm just telling you, I mean, I, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, but I, I, even on my phone, I have a, a, a reminder, an alert that goes off every morning, early in the morning, and it's prompting me to pray, and it's prompting me to spend time in the Word, because I realize that I cannot do what God's called me to do, and I cannot be, and I surely can't become 
who God has invited me to become without the power of God in my life. I can't do it in my own strength. And is it possible that maybe some of us have been trying to do it on our own strength and the supply of oil that the Lord intends to refresh every day and you go and you, and, you, and you use it and you spend it and you give it away and you come back to that place and once again, you hold out your empty cup because blessed are the poor in spirit. You hold out that empty cup and you say, Lord, I need your, your portion of anointing for today because today has its own challenges and today has its own pitfalls and today has its own people and, and I can't do it on yesterday's revelation. I can't do it on, 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 on last year's conference that I went to. Today, I need your presence in my life how many of us are like those five unwise ones who were just been distracted and we've been busy and we've been blowing and we've been going and we're dry three things that the enemy operates in to keep us from pursuing and developing and valuing and cherishing and deepening a relationship with the person of the holy spirit that allows us to live in power as believers Three things, they all start with P, procrastination, presumption, and priority. And in this case, misplaced priority. Procrastination, which is supported by this statement that we all tend to make in one way or the other, someday I'll make time or I'll give time. Someday I'll say yes to God. Someday I'll get back in church. Someday I'll begin to serve. Someday. And this is a powerful statement, but I believe it to be true, and this, that's this. God does not honor good intentions. He honors obedience. I mean, I, I, I know that could step on some toes, but come on, it's really true. I mean, maybe God looks and appreciates something that's in your heart, like something that's stirring in your heart about maybe one day going and doing or building or serving or giving or whatever, but I, I'm just telling you, I think that God looks down and he says, come on, let's go. He doesn't honor good intentions. He honors o- obedience to his word. What are you procrastinating that God's been calling you to? What have you been putting off? And it ties to number two, misplaced priority, which is basically just saying, I deserve what deserves my time. And you know, it's really true that the thing that I give my time most to is really perhaps the number one indicator of what matters most to me. Many of us are going and blowing and doing, I mean, even good things. And here's, that's the message the marriage, the family, the business, the work, the ministry, all the things that God's called you to, he wants to partner with you. He wants to be there in that place. He wants to be there in that moment. As your paracletos, your helper, your comforter, your advocate, your friend. It's time for us to once again prioritize God. Come on, dream big and start small. We say it around here often. Maybe it's just five minutes for you tomorrow morning. Or maybe it's just five or 10 minutes tonight before you lay your head and before your head hits that pillow to just take time and just give thanks to the Lord and just take account of your day and just just honor him and worship him. Tomorrow morning, maybe it's just a few minutes. Maybe right now you want to pull out and set an alarm for whatever time you think would be the right time to kind of remind you or introduce that to your life to say, I need to at least take five minutes. Listen, you you would say, Pastor T, are you saying I've got to make time every day for God? If you want to live in the power of God, you want to soar above everything that's pulling the world down and hindering them and holding them back and keeping them from living in joy and peace and identity and security and significance, that's exactly what I'm saying every day. You remember the manna that God used to feed the people of God as they were sojourning out of the wilderness and towards the promises of God? You remember God sent manna every day. Only one time a week as they were preparing for the Sabbath would God allow for them to collect two days portion of manna. Every other day, you remember the story, what would happen when they tried? The people tried. They tried, just like you and I. We would have tried it too. Don't, don't knock them. They tried to collect. They was like, hey, it's all here. Why don't we just gather up some more and then we won't have to come back out and do it again tomorrow morning. And they gathered and remember what happened? It rotted and it smelled like, it smelled and it had maggots. And here's the principle is that there's a daily provision that God desires to give you. Every day, there's a provision, there's a portion, there's an anointing, there's a grace, there's a strength, there's a peace that he desires to give you. Will we prioritize him? Will we value it enough? Listen, I I mean, I'm just telling you, what is it in your life that you're just realizing that maybe you've been spiritually dry and you're just, maybe you're, you're dealing with the frustration or the disappointment or you're grinding through life, you're grinding through life, you're grinding through marriage. And the, and the Lord is saying today, it's not an obligation, it's an invitation. Come and receive my oil for your life. 
that will allow things that are stuck to begin to get unstuck, that will allow things that are dead to become anointed and begin to come to life and begin to be fragrant once again. You gotta come and find it in my presence. Come on, who am I preaching to today? God's calling you back to that place of devotion. He's calling you back to that place of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Stop procrastinating. Prioritize him. Come on, what else matters in your life more than, than time with God? And the third P, and we'll close it up here, is presumption. And presumption is empowered by this statement. It's, surely I'll have another day. If procrastination is saying someday I'll get to it, presumption is this idea that we'll have time to get right with God. We'll have time to say yes to God. Right now I'm young and I'm going and I'm living, I'm dreaming, I'm doing, I'm experiencing what the world has to offer. I'll have time to get my life right with God. Can I tell you? You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not even guaranteed another breath. And that presumption, it's what these five unwise ones, they presume that someday they would have the moment to say, you know what, I've got good intentions. I love God, I believe in God, I wanna serve God. You might not have that moment. Listen, whether or not you have the opportunity and the privilege to be a part of the generation of believers that is taken home to be with the Lord in the rapture, I'm I'm preparing some notes to to, to preach a series on what the Bible has to say about the end times. I'll preach it this fall. So I'm in that world. I'm kind of studying and whatever. If you have the privilege of being a part of that generation or if God just comes and takes you home, don't presume that you have another day to do what God's called you to do to be who God's called you to be, to press in and to give your life away to the people in your life and in your community and in this church. And don't presume that you'll have another day. The Bible says that when that trumpet sounds, it'll happen in the twinkling of an eye. And they've studied that and they've said that's 1 40th of a second. Come on, that's not enough time. Now's the time to say, I'm no longer procrastinating. I'm not presuming. And today, today, from this day forward, I'm making it a priority to spend time with God. Just stand to your feet, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. Let's respond to him. Come on, make it personal. What's that look like for you? What's that look like for you to say, I I, I no longer want to procrastinate. I don't want to presume upon another time or day or season where at that time I'll start to serve God and know God and press into Jesus. And I want to make him the priority in my life, even in the midst of all the other things that he's invited me to, he's called me to. Come on, good things. That's the message. He wants to be there with you, helping you, strengthening you, empowering you to go and do all that he's called you to do. Lord, we just thank you for reminding us of some things today. Maybe there's some of us that we're even, this is a revelation to us. It's true, in the book of Acts, there were a group of believers who had put their faith in Jesus and they went to them and they said, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, we haven't even really heard about the Holy Spirit. They taught them about the Holy Spirit and they laid hands on them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe some of you today, it's the first time you've really been introduced to this idea that God really loves me so much that he wants to have a real time, present tense relationship with me. He's not some far off God. He wants to come and abide in me. He does. Oh, he longs for fellowship with you. He longs to have a relationship with you. And and, and like Paul wrote in in that scripture to the church at Corinth, you need to know the grace of God, you need to know the love of the Father, and you need to know fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we thank you. Listen, if I believe my heart and my belief is that what I'm about to lead us into, every person ought to want to respond to this. Because even if you've been walking in a relationship with the Holy Spirit for many years, maybe even decades, I'm trying to avoid eye contact with some of you because I don't want to date you. <laughs> maybe you've been walking with the Holy Spirit for years, maybe even decades. There's still more. There's still more. There's a freshness. There's a newness. There's a daily bread. There's a daily provision. There's a daily anointing. There's a new measure that he wants to give to you. So here's what I'm gonna ask us to do. If you desire just a fresh feeling, a fresh touch, a fresh relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, if you desire to have him come alongside you to be your paracletos, your advocate, your helper, your comforter, your counselor, and your friend, would you just lift your hands before you and just say, Lord, 
I, I, I need you. I, 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 I've been trying to do it. I've been trying to pull myself up by the bootstraps and do it by the sweat of my brow and do it in my own strength. And I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm weary. I can't do it. I can't, I can't keep just forging ahead and going. I need you. And Lord, we thank you. The Bible says that if imperfect fathers on this side of eternity have a desire and a heart to give their children gifts, in that context, he said, how much more will the Holy Spirit not, will the Father not give you the Holy Spirit? And, and we don't, as we're preaching about spending time with him and everything, we don't earn him, we don't deserve him, but the question isn't how filled can I be, it's how surrendered can I become? How, how, how available can I make myself? Lord, say, I'm a vessel, I'm a vessel. I'm a vessel. Would you fill me up? And as you fill me up, it's going to bring life and it's going to bring strength to me. But then I'm going to go into my workplace. I'm going to go into this community that desperately needs Jesus. And I'm going to have something to give to them. And I can't help them in my own strength. I'm not wise enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. But when the power of the Holy Spirit is operating in my life, I can go and do and be what Jesus was challenging his disciples. Be ready. Because I'm going to fill you with the Holy Spirit and you're going to go and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. That's his call on your life. Don't settle for less than everything that he has for you. Come on, if there's more of God, don't we want him today? Don't we want him today? Lord, we want you. Holy Spirit, we need you. Thank you, Lord. Just receive by faith right now. Just receive by faith right now. When Jesus was baptized, you remember, he came up out of that water and it said the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And it's just amazing to think about how it said like a dove. It wasn't a physical dove. It was like a dove, like a dove. And I'm just telling you, maybe from this day forward, there's just a way that we're going to begin to honor and appreciate the presence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, doves are flighty birds. But maybe today we're going to start to say, Lord, help me become more aware. There's a song that we sing. It says, let us become more aware of your presence. And Lord, I just thank you. I bless this congregation, every man, woman, every young person. I pray that from this day forward, that we would make ourselves available. We would prioritize. We wouldn't procrastinate. We wouldn't presume. We would present ourselves every day for a daily portion of your anointing in our lives. I just bless this church with that promise. And I thank you for grace and strength to begin to do it with a sustained way, Lord. Not just Sundays and Wednesdays, not for a short season, but this would become a lifestyle. Because I'm telling you, when you begin to experience it, it'll be, it's a game changer in your life. It's a game changer in your marriage. And Lord, we just thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, hey, before we worship one more time and dismiss you, the most important thing we do, the most important thing we do, and we do it every week. Even when the service is running a few minutes long, we do it every week. And that's give people the opportunity to come home to God. That's give people the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. That's give the prodigal sons and daughters who maybe once knew God and served God. Maybe you grew up in the church, but life's happened. You've gone your own way. Maybe you've been presuming that someday it would happen. You're just out sowing your wild oats or living the way that the world has you to live. I'm telling you, if that's you, today is your day of salvation. Don't presume. Don't procrastinate. Don't push it out. Say yes to God today. Or maybe you've never experienced what it feels like to have the weight of all your guilt and sin and shame, all your past failures and mistakes lifted off of your shoulders in a way that you could never do and never deserve. That's the message of the gospel. And if that's you, a prodigal son or daughter, if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life and been fully forgiven or anywhere in between, right now lift your hand. Right now lift your hand high towards heaven. This is just an outward sign of an inward work that God's doing in your heart, but I think it's important to begin to just publicly say, that's me, I need Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. One more moment. And if you're online, you're joining us and you're hearing this and your heart is burning, this is for you too. And I think even if you're not with anyone, you ought to stand to your feet, lift your hand because you're not responding to a preacher or a pastor. You're responding to a heavenly father who's calling you back to a place of relationship that transcends religion that says, get yourself right and then come to God. God says, come to me and I'll help you get things straightened out. Thank you, Lord. One more moment, if that's you, just lift your hand towards God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these precious people. Thank you, Lord, for that young man, Lord. Thank you for the future he has in you. Thank you that there's a, there's a grace, there's a call, there's a leadership on his life, Lord. Thank you that today something changes, something shifts in his life, God. He's gonna begin to discover what it looks like and what it feels like to be known by you and to know you and begin to live out your purposes, your plans for his life. Thank you for him, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hands going up all over this room. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can lower your hand if you responded to God. And here's what we're going to do with you. And we do it with you by design. 
for two reasons. One is we just want to come alongside you, all those precious people who lifted their hands to respond to Jesus. And, and we want to come alongside you and just quickly just say, man, come on, we want to be your brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to help you. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to strengthen you. We want to disciple you. We just want to begin to walk this life out with you. And two, we do it because it reminds us that even as we're building and growing in our maturity, building and growing our faith, that we never graduate from grace. Everything that God can and will and desires to build in our life, it's all built on the foundation of grace that we could never have deserved or earned. Come on, who's thankful for the grace of God? So come on, let's pray this prayer with those precious people. Repeat after me. Come on, do it with some passion today because there were a lot of people who gave their lives to Jesus. Come on, repeat after me. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I recognize my need for a savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could not pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you my life, I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, I will never be the same. Come on, say it with a shout and put your hands together with all of heaven. I will never be the same because of what Jesus has done. Hey, come on, let's worship the Lord one more time together today. Then Beth will come and dismiss you here in a moment.